Hi, this is Pastor Josh, and I just want to thank you for watching or listening to these teachings. Our hope is that through these teachings that you would learn more about God and grow closer to Him in relationship. But we also hope that these would be an additional teaching to what you already receive in your church home. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Cornerstone. So we do pray that through these teachings that you would hear God through the proclamation of His Word. Welcome everyone to the online teaching. This is our second week to do so as Cornerstone Church. And so, you know, welcome. Um, Thanks for logging on and watching this. Uh, Maybe it's Sunday morning, maybe it's not, maybe it's some other time. Um, In either case, thank you for jumping on and trying to get into God's Word. Um, This this is probably an adjustment for you, right? Some of the things that are happening in our world today, um, there's a lot of change happening. And here in Haskell, it's not as much of... Uh, an adjustment to our lives. There's a little bit, there's a little bit of change going on, but compared to the other parts of the world and compared to other parts of America, there's, there's not a ton um, of things happening here as other people are affected by it. Uh, but nevertheless, there is still an adjustment being made. Uh, if you think, if you're, if you're a teenager or if you're a child, you know, you're no longer able to go to school where you would be social with your friends. You'd get to hang out and have fun with your friends and be with your teachers and learn from them face to face. And, and uh, you're no longer being able to do in, to, to do sports. And so that's a big change for you. I, I understand that. Um, if you're a parent, now your child is home, right? Maybe a college child's home. And so you're adjusting your life to this uh, full-time parent once again, or maybe for the first time besides summers. And so this is new for you. Your child's learning online. Um, Maybe you've lost a job because of the economy and things like that. And so you're adjusting to that. And and even as a a senior adult, uh, things are still different. You may not feel as comfortable going to the store like you once did, or you're needing help with those sorts of things. And so whatever the case is, the reality is that, that life has been changed for us. Life is now having to be adjusted to what's happening. And here's the truth. As a pastor, I would know this, right? Uh, I know that even church people, Christians, do not like change, especially when uh, it's changed out of the blue, just out of nowhere with no communication. That's one of the things that we do not like. And so there's a reality here, right, that this is what is happening. Our lives have been changed and uh, the, reali- the reality, you think about this, for, for some people, for some of you listening online right now, maybe not, but for some of you, this really isn't that big of a change. Not, not as far as the other parts of your life go, but as far as church goes. Uh, let's be real for a moment, right? Uh, from ages 18 to 35, there was a, a survey done last year in the year 2019, and it showed just about 50% uh, of that age, of Christians that age, 18 to 35, that they attend church once, uh, well, actually less than that, excuse me, uh, they attend church less than once a month, okay? Uh, there's about 54% that attend l- once a month. And so, you know, just think about that. What that says is that for many so-called Christians, that they don't attend church, but once every few months, maybe, uh, 10% never even show up in church, never gather in church. And, you know, as I say the word attendance, that's that's, that's a word that I don't like to say out loud. Um, Here at Cornerstone, we talk about participation. Um, we don't attend church. We don't just, uh, uh, the word attendance seems like, you know, I'm going to show up. I'm just going to sit down. I'm just going to listen and do whatever. Uh, that's what attendance is. But we want to be participators. Uh, when we come to worship on Sunday morning, we want to participate and listen and get into the Bible and, and maybe use your gift in whatever capacity that you can in another gathering of ours. But we talk about participation here. But I don't want to go down too far on that rabbit trail. Uh, I, I just want to, to, to share with you that we're making adjustments to our lives, right? Uh, things are changing around us, and so 
this week as I began to pray and to consider, Lord, what is it that you would have for us? I know we've been going through the book of John, but, you know, just this week, I don't, it doesn't seem that we need to be there yet, and maybe we'll be in there next week after that as I pray to you some more, but for this week, it seems there's one more message at least that that you want to share with him, and, and I believe that that message that he wants to share with you revolves around how you and I are to live life in the midst of this pandemic. So you remember last week we we kind of talked about four responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and you know it was more of a, a reaction to how we feel to these situations of having peace and not panic and yeah you know being um, compassionate not a critic and those sorts of things. But this week uh, I want to be able to speak into your lives not from me but from God's word. What does God have to say about living through uh, this pandemic, and really more so, what does he have to say about living through change, living through adjustments in our lives? Uh, and so what I want to do is get into that in just a moment. I'm going to pray for us. And so, you know, right now, uh, you may want to just push pause before we even jump into here. And as a family, uh, turn on Spotify or iTunes or play your piano if you have one or guitar or sing a cappella, right? Uh, just sing a few songs uh, with your family and kind of treat this as a worship time for you and your family. And then you can come back in and we'll pray and we'll jump right into the Word, okay? But that's where I'm headed. I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into the Word. And so let, let's, let's go to the Lord. Father, uh, we praise you once again just for your mercy upon our lives, for your kindness upon our lives. Oh God, you are worthy to be praised all the time. You are worthy for us to give your all of our lives to you fully. Everything that we have, every drop of sweat, every beat of our heart, every breath in our lungs, we want it to be about you and for your glory because you are worthy of that. And so once again, as we gather in really um, a different way for us, through media, uh, through internet, we ask that you would bless this time. We ask that you would grow us as believers to, by the end of our time together, that we would just worship you even more and even deeper. And if any on here are watching or listening to this, that they would come to know you, the one true God, our maker. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing. And Father, I pray for myself that you would lead me to speak only your words and not my words. And if those words come out, that the ears that they fall upon, that it would um, just ignore those words and only hear what your spirit has to say. And so we pray this for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's basically the title. Here's where we're headed at this morning. I'm going to give you five emphasis for Christians that can't gather. That's the title this morning. Five emphasis for Christians that can't gather. What is it that the Lord says for us as believers um, on how we're to live our life in the midst of all this change, in the midst of adjustment? And so here's five emphasis. Here's our first emphasis um, this morning or this evening, whenever you're watching this, the first emphasis is this, tune the radio, okay? Tune the radio. Say it with me, okay? Say it through the screen. Ready? Tune the radio. And for some of you church folks, you've heard me say this before, but if, if you haven't heard me say that, you're thinking, what does tune the radio mean, right? So back in the day, they used to have... Uh, like way back in the day, right? They, like some of us don't even know what a radio is. That we think of the 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 car radio, but you could think of that. But they had these other things, these little boxes um, that had speakers, right? But on this radio, there was two dials. The one had a volume dial, and the other one was uh, the station finder. You would use it, and it would move the needle across these numbers to find the station. Uh, today, we just get in the car and we push the button and it automatically finds, finds the station for us. But back in the day, you had to actually do the work. You had to, you know, tweak it and turn it to the right and turn it to the left. And you'd hear that, that, that noise come through uh, of maybe the, the talk show saying, hey, well, good morning, everybody. You're like, and you would hear the static, right? But there was a sweet spot that when you turned it just the right amount, 
you would hear your, your favorite tune come in. And I don't, I'm not going to sing the tune. Uh, maybe if we were in, in real, a real life gathering here, I would sing it for you. But I'm not going to sing it for you on the internet because then it'll be everywhere. And I'm not going to embarrass myself. But here's, here's, here's what I'm meaning by tune the radio is you and I, uh, just like that radio, when we wake up in the morning, we're full of static in our lives. We're just a bunch of sh- and that's where, where our heads are at. That's where our hearts are at. That's the direction of our lives. And so it's very important that as believers, what you and I do every single morning and, and, and throughout the day is that we tune our radio to God's station, to the Holy Spirit, and to His Word, to hear what He has to say for us for this day. And so when you wake up, you have to, you have to get in His Word, and you have to pray and be with the Lord, and slowly turn that station so that, you, you know, it's static, and, and you get in the Word, and maybe you get your coffee too, right? And you begin to listen to the Lord, trying to find Him, and then you'll hit that sweet spot. That sweet spot where you can hear him and you're with him and, and you're, you're hearing the direction for your life and you're hearing the motivation for your life today and you're hearing um, what you're called to do and the purpose in what you're called to do. But see, when you fall asleep, those things get scattered in our brains and in our hearts. So when we wake up the next morning, again, we're hearing static and we have to come back to the Lord. And so I, what I want to do is I want to point you to Daniel, Daniel chapter 6 um, in your Bible. And I should have marked these before, but I didn't. And so you'll just have to bear with me. You can fast forward if you need to. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, and we're gonna, I'm going to read to you a couple of verses here, 5 through 10. And uh, I'll go ahead and read that to you and then explain it to you. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 5, uh, going on to verse 10, this is what it says. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Now watch. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And he goes on to say, then these men came by agreement, found Daniel, make a petition and plead before his God. And then they basically go tattletale on him. And that was the whole plan. And so Daniel ends up in the lion's den and God protects him from the lions. And he, he comes out and, and he's just blessed by all these things. I point you to this text this morning or whenever, whatever the time is, I'm just going to say this morning for now on. But I point you to Daniel chapter 6 this morning because if you look at Daniel 1, and I, and I would challenge you to go read that today, uh, just kind of read through the book of Daniel, uh, or at least until you get to chapter 6. What happened was Daniel and some of the others the, of the nation of Israel, because of their sin, not necessarily Daniel's, but the nation as a whole, they were taken captive by another nation. And so Daniel and them were taken to this other nation, and and now they're under this king, and this is really another king at that point. But but think about this for a moment, okay? Because this is very common to what's happening to you and I. Uh, Not so much in the, the, the captivity as much, but 
Daniel was living in the kingdom of Israel one day, and then the next he was taken to another kingdom where he was having to adjust his life to the language, to the culture, to, to the city, and to all these things. But in the midst of all this adjustment, of all this change that was going around him, what was an emphasis that he kept in his life? Uh, despite what the law said, here was the emphasis. He spent time with the Lord. It says that he, he came to him three times. He got on his knees and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God. That's all found in verse 10. This is what was happening. Daniel was tuning that radio. He was making sure three times a day he was tuning it so that he could hear the Lord, that he could, he could um, be, have the direction from the Lord, that he, he would be faithful to the Lord and have the power of the Lord while he was in the midst of adjustment and change. That's what was happening. And this, is, this isn't just for Daniel. Jesus did it. I mean, think about this. Jesus himself, there were several times in the scripture where he, he, he goes away on the mountain to pray. In Luke 5.16, it says he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. In Matthew 6.46, it says after feeding the 5,000, what did he do? He went up to the mountain and he prayed. Before he called the, the, the 12 apostles, he went to a desolate place and he prayed. And he was spending time with his father before he was arrested and, and crucified on the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane doing what? Praying to his Father. He was listening to God. The psalm, the psalm writer tells us in Psalm 119, 147, that he, he, this is what it says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. And, and believer and unbeliever, I would say this to you today, that, that we need help, right? We need hope. And according to the psalm, it tells us that we get that help and we get our hope from the Lord. And so we have to be spending time tuning our radio so that we can hear the clear channel of where God is saying to us. But let me ask you this. Why? Why would we do that? Like, what is your motivation for wanting to spend time to tune that radio? I know the psalm just said, like, for help and for hope, but it has to be for more than those things. Yes, we seek the Lord for help. Yes, we seek the Lord for hope. But we should also seek the Lord because of our hearts, because we have a deep affection for Jesus. And you cannot have that affection. You cannot have the heart to follow God and to want to see Him and to spend time with Him every day of your life, tuning that radio, unless you know what He has done for you, unless you can reflect on the good news of the gospel. Amen? See, it starts with the heart. And when you have the heart, it'll motivate you to tune the radio daily. But you may not be tuning the radio because you don't have the heart. And you don't have the heart because you've never heard the gospel message in your life. And so, uh, believers and unbelievers, let me share with you the message. I know you as a believer, you know the message. But rejoice in the fact that you get to hear this great news that has saved you in your life. The great news that Jesus Christ himself bore our sins so that we would be forgiven he made us a path back to the Father so that we could know Him in a relationship again. Now, now Jesus says, you know, that we're to follow Him in our lives. In Psalm 27, this is what it says here about, about you know, being with the Lord. Uh, Psalm 27, 8, You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Your face, Lord, do I seek. You have to know this good news of the gospel that God loves us so much to rescue us out of our sin, to rescue us out of our rebellion, to rescue us from the life that we're living defeated by the things of this world. 
He wants us to live in victory. He wants us to live in abundance. Not in the riches of the world, but in abundance of his love. And we can only do that by tuning the radio every single day and listening to him and going where he wants, just as Daniel did. And so, are you making those adjustments? If you're not, and maybe you are, I I would say this. Keep this as an emphasis in your life in the coming days and weeks and maybe months if necessary, right? As we're all adjusting to these changes. Keep this emphasis of tuning the radio in your life to be near the Lord. That's emphasis number one. We move on to emphasis number two and it would be this. Fathers, lead your family. Fathers, lead your family. Now, I'm primarily here talking to fathers, okay? I'm talking to the men of the house, but I understand that, you know, some of, some of your families, uh, there is no father there. There is no man there. Uh, you're a single, single mother um, raising your kids, or maybe you're a grandparent who, who have really adopted your grandchildren, and now you're really their parents, okay? Or maybe you're just a guardian that you, you have... Um, these children uh, in your care right now, and so it's still your responsibility. So some of this is going to apply to you, and I don't want you to just push pause or fast forward here. Uh, I I want you to hear this and hear the message, really, Um, but here's the main target. I'm just going to talk to fathers at this point, and I know this kind of spills over to you, and just listen along, but uh, I want to share with you two passages, fathers and and men, Um, You don't have to just be a father. You'd be a man and a husband, that sort of thing. Uh, But I want to share with you two passages of what the Scripture would would remind us and emphasize to us on how we're to live our lives and the adjustment and change. Ephesians chapter uh, 5. I want to read uh, 25 through 33 to you. And um, so let me just read a portion of this to you. A lot of reading of the Scripture today, which is good, so you can hear the Scripture. 525 says this, husbands, love your wives, love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Let me say that again. He who loves his wife loves himself. 29, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of it, of of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, let me, let me read verse 4 to you of chapter 6. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And I'm going to read another passage to you. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is really where we get the Ten Commandments from. It's, it's right there. And so Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, it says this, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And what we go on to verse 20 here, When your son asks you in time to come, What is the meaning of the testimonies and the statues and the rules that the Lord your God has commanded you? Now, this is right after these Ten Commandments. Then you shall say to your son, uh, and then he goes on to how the Lord brought them out of Egypt and and just teaching them these things. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, Ephesians 5, and then there's many other verses in the Bible. But these passages came to my mind this week as I... I really prayed about our church um, and about anybody who's maybe watching this video right now. As I prayed, okay, Lord, during these adjustment times, what is something we need to hear? What is something that we need to emphasize? And, and as a father, 
as a husband. This was something that even popped up in my own life of how men, we have to lead our families. You know, I think, uh, uh, men, I think of you as a pastor in your own home. That, that's really what you are. You have, to, you have the responsibility to shepherd your own family, as we saw in Ephesians 5 and 6 and Deuteronomy 6. It is your responsibility to do those things. And right now, you don't have the church. The church is here and, and supplementing you, right? You don't have those church gatherings to supplement you. So the pr- primary, and really the, the, it always is the primary um, way in which the Lord grows the family, is through you. It is through the man that you are to love your wife and, oh, and to discipline and instruct your children and the Lord to teach them all these things as you're walking and going. And, and, and so, so that means basically in informal times as you're mowing the lawn, just talking with, the, talking with your child uh, and, and modeling that for them. And, and, and then also just in a formal time of teaching. Yesterday I was mowing the lawn with, with, with my little two-year-old. And obviously you have to be super careful with that, right? Because there's rocks and stuff. So he was standing right here beside me on the left and we would... I would push the mower, and he would push his, he had his little lawnmower with the bubbles. And so one of the reasons I was doing that is I could have, I could have got the lawn done. I didn't even finish. I only got half of it done because I was mowing with him, and we were going so slow. Uh, but the reason I did that is because I thought, you know, the, the lawn will grow again, and I'll have to mow the lawn once again. But my child, this opportunity may never come again. Or it's going to speak something to him. And I want to show him that I love him, that I care for him. And so I'm showing him the scriptures of what it looks like to, to be loved by a father. And not for me, but so that he can understand who God is and, and who's patient and trying to spend time uh, uh, with him. And so fathers, I, I, I ask you, I plead with you. Seriously, father. And husbands, I plead with you. To lead your family doesn't mean you're going to lead them to the Lord, but you have the responsibility to lead them in worship of the Lord, to, to give them the scriptures and to reveal to them um, who God is. As Christ, lo- look, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So what we're doing when we love our wives is we're proclaiming to her what it looks like for Christ to love her, for Christ to to pursue her, for, for Christ to have an affection for her so that she could, she could look through us as husbands and see God and say, oh, how worthy, how beautiful, how amazing is God. And so men, we have to step up to the plate. We have to step up also in, in this time of adjustment to make sure that we are, in fact, leading our families. And you may say, you may say this, I can't lead my family. I'm inadequate. You may have a fear, right? You, you, you may feel just that word. You may feel inadequate for this, like, there's no way I can do that. How am I supposed to do that? I can't even teach. It's hard for me to read. It's hard for me to pray. It's hard for me to do these things. Well, if you're if your thinking is, I'm inadequate, I'm not capable of doing this, then look at me right now. Uh, I'm a pastor of Cornerstone Church. And if anyone was inadequate, if anyone was incapable of doing these things, it would be me. <laughs> I, I mean, you're looking at a role model of someone who is incapable and inadequate of doing something, but are able to do it. And how are they able to do it? Not because I'm, I'm, I have the capacity to do it, but because God in me, the Holy Spirit in me, when I lean fully on him, he's the one who does the things. And so I can pastor and I, I can uh, help the church, not because of me, but because of what God's doing in me and with me. And it's the same for you, dear brother. And if you're a single mother, all, the, all you other ones included, here's what the Lord would say through the Holy Spirit. He is in you. Now, now just, just sit and ponder on that for just a moment. Wait a minute. 
the God of Genesis, the one who says, in, uh, who, who says, let there be light, right? And then all of a sudden there's light at the word of his mouth. That God, uh, the Jesus who said, rise and stand up, uh, the Son of God. God himself, the Holy Spirit, is in me. And, and when I say me, I'm talking about you as a believer, as, as, a, as a brother, as a man, as a husband, as a father. He's in you. And if you have God in you, well, what's, that, what's, the, what's the scripture that says this? Um, All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Or reverse wise, right? With God, all things are possible. And if you have God in your life, this is very possible for you to lead your own family in worship during this time. Because we're not gathering as churches, right? You're gathering in your own home with your, with your wife, your spouse, your sister, your grand, whatever, whoever's there, right? You have the responsibility. You have that role to lead them in worship to the Lord. And you have the Holy Spirit in you who will help you do these things. So you may feel inadequate. You may feel incapable. That's good. Lean fully on the Lord because that's where your strength will be. When you begin to, to, to lean upon yourself, that's when you're going to see um, the errors and the flaws and, and a bunch of flesh coming out. Not Holy Spirit fruit. And so let me just give you a practical thing of how you can lead your families in worship. It's called family worship. That's it. It's just called family worship. Try it one time a week. Just do it one time a week. It's simple. I, there was a, my previous church that, that I served in. I tried to lead some of our families and some of our men to, to begin doing family worship in their life. Um, and, you know, I don't know if they ever established that in their life. If they did... Here's what's beautiful about it. They, they, already, they, they were prepared for what was happening right now today. When the church stopped gathering, they, they were still worshiping the Lord in their own homes, and, and they kept on going, and they're doing that right now um, if they were doing that. But, so family worship, just kind of three things real simple. Uh, read, pray, sing. And, and reading would include explaining. And that's where you may feel inadequate again. But really it's, you know, explain the application. So read the scripture, uh, Matthew 12, 28, or, or Mark 12, 28. I can't remember. I think Mark 12, 28 and 30, right? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you've just read the scripture. You keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't get complicated. Don't be preaching for an hour like, like Brother Josh does, right? Myself, I called myself Brother Josh, third person there. Um, you don't have to preach for an hour. Just read the scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And then apply that. You, and this is how you can apply it. Just ask a question. So what does it look like to love God with all your heart? What does that look like with all your strength? Like what is something that you really love in life? I love tacos. So, so what do you do? Every Tuesday I go to Rosa's and I get tacos because I love tacos. That's what it looks like to love tacos. So if you are... Uh, you love tacos so much that you're very intentional about your Tuesday. Now look at what that would look like for the Lord. If you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, right? Then you would be intentional about when you meet with Him. If you're intentional about meeting with, up with tacos, to eat those tacos, then you've got to be intentional, or you have to be intentional, right? Excuse me, Rach. You have to be intentional about your relationship with the Lord. Very simple. This is just a question. I, I, I wasn't planning on that. I just did that just now. But just read the scripture. Apply it to your life. That's it. How are you going to do that this week? Pray for another. And so as a father, you can pray for your wife. Or you pray for your child. And just say, I pray for that, that, that they would learn how to love you more, Lord. And, and that I would be a good role model of that. And, and say, amen. And then sing a song. Uh, you could put on, on YouTube or Spotify or play guitar or a cappella, but, but we have to lead. Men, we have to lead. And, and women, I would say this to you. Encourage your husband, please. Please encourage your husband. Uh, I mean, he, he probably feels inadequate and incapable of doing these things. So encourage him. Don't want, if he forgets, 
Oh, I didn't do worship. I didn't do family worship this week. If he forgets, don't go to him bitter or don't go to him in anger or don't go to him trying to beat him down and saying, see, you didn't even do this. Go to him in encouragement. Maybe you don't even say anything. Pray for him. Pray for him. Father, Father in heaven. Oh, I want uh, my husband, he, 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 he's forgot family worship this week and I don't want him to feel just convicted and super guilty about this, but I want him to be encouraged uh, that you still love him and that, that you're with him. So, so women, yeah, encourage him and, and to do these things. And children, have fun and enjoy your fathers doing this. And again, if you're not a father, you're a single mother, you're a grandparent, you're just a, um, a guardian, you still have that responsibility too. And I'd say that lead your family in those things. And I get you know, we live in an age today, right, where it's like, uh, well, what about the women? What about this? And here's the reality. You could talk about that some other time, but here's the emphasis that it says, husbands, lead your family, please. Husbands, love your wife, lead your children in the, in the worship gathering of your family. Now, let's keep going. Um, I thought about this for a moment of, well, what if we run out of time? But I really don't have a time limit here because here's the fact. You're watching online. You've pushed pause at any moment that you want. And you probably are, right? You, you push pause in a moment and you say, I got to go to the restroom. Push pause in a minute. I'm going to go get a drink. Uh, push pause in a minute. Um, or, or if it's a subject you don't like, which we're probably going to get into one in just a moment, you're going to say, I'll be right back. And so I may be preaching an hour, two hours. That's okay. Uh, leave us a comment, okay, uh, about what you would um, maybe like to learn. And I'll, I'll preach for an hour or two on it uh, because I can easily do that. Or teach. Teach is probably the better word for that. But let's keep going. Emphasis number three, consider spiritual warfare. Consider. So the first one, emphasis number one, was to tune the radio. The emphasis number two was for fathers to lead your family. And then emphasis number three was, is this, consider spiritual warfare. Now, we live, in here, we live here in America, but if you're watching this from somewhere else, this may not apply to you. But here in America, what we love to do is to de-spiritualize everything. We just like to talk about it like it's all normal, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's just, that's the way things work. And we never want to think about the spiritual side of these things. And so, again, in Ephesians, I'm going to read this passage to you, or not a passage, just a few verses. Ephesians chapter 6 um, beginning in verse 10, it says this, uh, finally, finally, this is Paul uh, writing to the church in Ephesus here, and he's concluding uh, this, this really beautiful letter that he's written. The first three chapters is all about doctrine. The last three is like this application of, of how you do this. And so he goes, finally, 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 we're here. I'm closing the letter. And then he goes on, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Well, well, Paul says that. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now watch this, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. Paul talks to the, the church in Ephesus here, and he goes, let me remind you, church, that what you see um, with your eyes isn't always the reality of what's happening. There is something deeper behind these things. There, there, if you had some spiritual glasses, you would be able to see that you're not fighting against simply, what does he say? flesh, and blood. He says, we're in battle. We're in a battle here against spiritual forces. And so, as we consider, like, the things that happen in our world, um, some of them, yeah, you may just say, oh, spiritual, but like the normal things. You just say, well, we're just, there's people are getting sick, and you know, the governments are just kind of responding to the sickness. And if that's your attitude, you missed it. I mean, you've, you've just, you've missed it and you've already been defeated. 
Because Paul himself says, over these present darkness. Now he's talking there, but there's present darkness today. We can be uh, certain of that. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not, we're not wrestling against um, governors and uh, presidents and, and, and uh, other leaders of the world. We're not wrestling against them. We're wrestling against something else. We're, we're wrestling against <laughs> spiritual forces of evil. That's what it says. If you don't like this talk, then <laughs> this is what you do. Close your Bible and put it up because that's, that's not what I'm saying. It's, what, it's the exact word of God. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's spiritual warfare, everyone. Spiritual warfare. Warfare. Much of what's going on in the world. Just think about this for a minute. We want to. We want to um, despiritualize it, right? It's just a sickness going on. But, but think about this for the for a second. It is very rare, uh, very extremely rare, for the world to react this way to. A sickness. They say, well, it's a pandemic. That's why people are reacting this way. Whatever. If that's a, here's, a, here's where we're at. The world has responded. Leaders have responded with shutdowns and lockdowns of the world. It, it would be one thing if it was just like America or just a city. But even then, it'd still be this. But this is a worldwide thing. Not every country, right? But but there's le- the China was shut down and locked down. Italy, Europe, parts of Europe, um, parts of America now. Some of the big players in the world are shutting down and there are restrictions and there's all these sorts of things. Um, consider the bill, the, the, this relief bill that just came out to, to help us during these troubling economic times, right? Um, is that 100% pure? And what I mean by that is, is Every penny of that, what, two trillion, or I can't even remember how much it is now, of that, that extreme number, uh, is all that money going straight to help everything with coronavirus and us people in the economy, or was there some loopholes thrown into there to um, benefit themselves? I don't know. I don't know, but I would say this. If you think, oh, oh, I'll put it this way, there is a um, politician or a leader, I can't remember who it was, but they said it this way, never let a good crisis go to waste. Never let a good crisis go to waste. And, and what that means is uh, when there's a crisis, um, make sure that you get as much that you could get done, it, not just the relief of the crisis, but everything else that you can sneak in there at the same time. And you have to be foolish to think that there is not this utilizing the crisis to get other things done that have nothing to do with the crisis but have to do with personal agenda. But then when you look at the scripture and it says it's not, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, it's really not even against personal agenda. It's against a spiritual, or it's, it's a spiritual reality of the demonic dark forces that are working in and through human leaders and, and other people, not everyone, right, but, but many of them that are doing these things for their own agenda. And, and Paul here warns us to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, to put on our armor, to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why? Because the spiritual forces and the devil are against us. So whatever is happening behind the scenes today, right now, going on, is for your harm. And you have to recognize that. You have to recognize right now is a time of deep spiritual warfare. So I emphasize, and I believe the Lord, that's why I'm bringing it up, because I believe it's the Lord who's saying this to us, that we must emphasize uh, to consider spiritual warfare during this time. 
We have to be praying for one another, considering one another. That's what it says. I'm not going to go into all how we have uh, protect ourselves in it. Just read the, the rest of chapter 6 and you'll see what the armor of God is to protect us. But one of those things in verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit. Praying at all times in the Spirit with supplication. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplications for the saints and for also me. It goes on to proclaim, so that he could proclaim uh, the mystery of the gospel boldly. So pray. Pray during this time because there's spiritual warfare going on. Pray for leaders that the Lord would use them for his purposes, for his glory, for the, for the salvation of many, that God would be doing these things. Let's move on. If, if, emphasis number four be mission-minded. Be missional-minded. Um, Philippians 2. I'm going to go ahead and turn there. Again, you can fast forward if you need to, but I just want to I want to read these scriptures to you. Um, and I'm not going to apologize for going an hour here because you're on video. You pause it if you want to. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. As we emphasize missional-minded, I want to give you the mind of Christ. Uh, Let each of you not only look to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Here we go, verse 5, the mind of Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The mind of Christ here. This is the pre-incarnate Son of God. Uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have the pre-incarnate Son of God who was, who was with Father God and the Holy Spirit before all time began, before it all created. And upon, you know, there is this plan, uh, but to, to resolve the sin issue of our lives, which our rebellion has, again, it's separated us from our Lord. It, it has uh, removed us from that relationship with Him. And so to resolve that problem so we could be reconciled unto God once again, Jesus said, I'll go down there, Father. I'll go down there. I will live perfectly so that they can have my righteousness. I will never fail you, not once. I'll be obedient to you even to the point of death so that they will have my righteousness. And I will die on that cross. I will put all their sin upon me. I will take your wrath and put it upon me. So that they can know you once again. So that they can have a life with you once again. With us as God. I'll do it. So Jesus was missional minded. He had the mind to come down and to serve us and to be with us. If anyone was not to do it, it was Jesus. But he chose to do it. And he washed the feet of the people. Of his apostles. It was Jesus who had this mind. Now, he accomplishes his part of the mission. He accomplishes it. He died on the cross. He rises again, proving uh, that the Lord has accepted the payment for sin, meaning that you and I can come to him once again. We have righteousness and we have forgiveness in Jesus. And then he leaves the disciples, the apostles here, and you and I with this command found in Matthew 28. In verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. So this goes exactly with Philippians 2, where every knee will bow before him because he is worthy, because he came, because he had a mission mind and said, I'm coming to save them. And he goes, look, I've rescued you. You don't see it fully. The world doesn't see it fully, but I've already rescued you. You have to believe that. But he tells them, Because I have all authority, here's what I want you to do. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in my name, Father, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Okay, so think about this. Uh, Jesus was mission-minded. He accomplished his part of the mission. That is what's so good about this good news, that the Father sent him to, to reconcile us with himself. Jesus does it, and now Jesus says, look, disciples, you're on my team. And if you're on my team, you have to be missional-minded, meaning you have to go into the world and tell them the good news. Tell them the great news, that they can know my Father again, that they're forgiven, and all these other things that come along with that. And then they pass it on. And as a church, today, in, in 2020, in the year 2020, in the month of March, uh, we have that same responsibility to go into the world. Now, say that with this, this understanding. Uh, we may ask the question, well, how are we supposed to go into the world today? Right? That, that's why I'm bringing this up as an emphasis for us. Because I believe this is what the Lord wants us to see. I'm bringing this up because we, want, we might be saying uh, we can't be mission-minded right now. I, I mean, we're all stuck in our homes. We, all, we, we can't go here. We can't go there. We can't gather with this. We can't. We are to be mission-minded at all times. Uh, if, if we're never to be mission, when we're done with being mission-minded, God will take us back. And really, we'll be mission-minded because we'll just want to glorify God all the time. But he, here's what's happening. In the adjustment that you're having to make in your life right now, you're also having to make an adjustment and a change in your life about how to be missional in this type of life in which we're living. And so I'll, I'll just share with you one of the things that we did as a church, not to brag, but I'm encouraged by it. I'm excited by it. I was able to call um, some of our members, not everyone, not every one of you got a call and, and you can message me if you want to be included in this. But I called a few of our, our church members and I just said, look, I'm going to the phone book, the Haskell phone book. And I want you to take, I would love for you to take a letter um, to adopt a letter in the phone book and to call everybody in that letter. So, example, take the letter G in the in the uh, phone book, and it may the last name be maybe uh, Gonzalez and whatever else, right? Guzman. Okay, and so they're just going to go down that list and call. And this is what we were, were attempting to do. We wanted to call our community of of Haskell, and we wanted to let them know who we were. First of all. Like, so when I called, I just say, hey, I'm Josh. I'm the pastor at Cornerstone. Um, so first of all, they know who I am, right? And this is what we did next. We asked for prayer and for any needs. Um, and so we just said, hey, we're, we're just reaching out and seeing if we needed prayer for anything. Why? Because we understand people are having to make adjustments in their lives and some things have been greatly changed in their lives. And, and this is a great time that people need prayer. And we want to pray with them. We want them to know someone loves them because we're simply messengers of God. And, and so we asked that, that, could we pray for them in any way? And then we asked for a need, if they have any needs in any way. And we understand we can't meet all the needs, but if there is a need we can meet, we're going to meet it. And also, we can pray about that need, and the Lord can meet it if he wants to. So that was one of the things that we did. But in order to get into... Uh, in order to do those sorts of things, you have to get outside of the box in which we normally think. Well, we have to go door to door and all these things, and we can't go door to door, and we can't have an event, and we can't do this. Don't think about what you can't do during this time. Think about what you can do during this time. What is it that you, you are capable of being able to do? You can call people. You can make videos. You can, you can send Facebook messages and emails and, and just encourage people. And, and I would say, do these things. Encourage people and, and, and call people and video call people and do whatever is necessary to get the mission out there to tell people about Jesus. And so if you're watching this right now and you're not a believer and, and you just heard like what we're doing, this is what you should be hearing. You should be hearing this, that we as Cornerstone care about you, that we're trying to find a way into your life any way possible. A front door, back door, side door, the window, if we knock on it and you let us in through the window. Whatever way, right? But we want to get into your life because we have a message that we want to give you. A message of hope. A message of, of life. 
a message of truth. This is a perfect illustration for what's going on right now in this emphasis on like this. I know I've almost been going an hour. It's good. Uh, this virus that's going on, right? Now imagine for a moment that we all had, that, that the church had the, the cure for this, coronavirus. But we're all thinking, you know, we're not supposed to be out there. We're not going to do nothing. Um, and so we just keep the pill in our house. All these pills, we have a stockpile of pills. It's just one little pill. You just swallow it and you're cured from coronavirus. Very simple, right? But as a church, we're all just hanging out like, no, we're not going out there. It's too crazy. If we were to do that, we would reveal to people that we actually hate them because we have the cure, but we're not giving it to them. And it's, it's, I can't even give you a number, a, a multiplication, how many times more greater it is for us when we don't do that with the gospel. See, coronavirus, it, you can get healed from it or, or whatever, but the gospel, the gospel is the healing for sin. The gospel is what heals us from being um, separated from our God. And so it's the gospel that is the message and that is the cure for people and is the reason that you should be watching this so that you can grow in the gospel. And so we have to have a mission mind. I'm going to move on as, as we to our last point here. Emphasis number five, give graciously and cheerfully. Give graciously and cheerfully. Now, there's obviously many different ways and you can give. You can give your time, you can give your energy, you can give your effort, you can give your um, ac- whatever activities or whatever you're giving, you can give. But specifically what I'm talking about here is financial giving. And, and some people go, oh, did you just say financial giving? It's one of those weird things that people, like I hear pastors that don't want to talk about that. Um, I don't mind talking about it at, at all. I don't mind sharing. I mean, uh, when we get to it, we haven't been, we haven't talked about finances because we're going through the book of John and we just haven't had a time where it's, where it shows us those things, but we'll get there one day. Um, but right now I just want to share with it because I believe this is an emphasis that we have to have, we must have as a church um, during this time of change and, um, and adjustments. And I want to speak to you about finances because finances is something that affects your relationship with God. Um, there's a saying that goes, uh, how's it go? Uh, show me your checkbook and I'll show you your God. That's what, show me your checkbook. We have, some people don't have checkbooks today, right? It's like, so show me your debit card or your bank statement, um, bill, and I will show you your God. Because basically you go through there and say you spend all your money on athletic wear or you spend all your money on books or you spend all your money on getting your nails done, your hair done, or on your car or on basketball or whatever, right? And and the reality is it does. It shows us really what we're worshiping, um, how we spend our money. But I think it not only shows us what we're worshiping, it shows us our hearts uh, of how we feel about God. Um, And I know that goes hand in hand. But I'm not afraid to talk to you about money and talk to you about finances because it's really about your heart and and I care about that area of your life and the Lord. I want the Lord to be your master and Lord over all of your life. I want him to be the Lord over all of my life. And so let me just read a a passage to you real quick. Acts 2.45 says this, They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And in Philippians 4, it goes on to say, Paul goes on to say how he's just thankful for them, giving him gifts to support him on the mission field and to do these few things. And um, I bring this up. There was a couple of pastors I talked to who just mentioned this last week and the week before how their giving had tremendously declined and they, you know, they're know, they having to make some changes and people may have to be um, removed from, from that position, whatever. And so I say this because, you know, we still have expenses here as a church. Uh, right now, the utilities are on, the lights are on. That's why we're able to record, our internet's on. Um, the program in which we can put it on Facebook, we have to pay for programs. 
Uh, we pay for insurance and we're paying for all these other things that we're still paying for. And so that's when I, I emphasize, hey, giving is still necessary. Giving is still needed. Uh, when, we, when we called all those people and they said, hey, we would like, we would need this or we need that. Uh, we have the funds to be able to do that because you have given. Um, but if anybody, if we stop giving, you know, we may not be able to do that much longer. And, and here's the reality, you know, if, if we have to make changes, we'll make changes. Uh, because I truly believe the Lord provides what we need, not what we want. That's, that's clear in the scriptures. Um, but you need to at least hear it from me, your pastor, to say, hey, make sure that this is a time that you're still emphasizing giving, that you don't let that slide under the radar and you don't just say, oh, I forgot about it. And, and don't think that that I'm trying to get rich here because it's not about that. Uh, think about the, we, we have an annual budget every September. We all vote on it. And technically, I don't even vote. I don't get to vote. Uh, I'm the one leading it. And so you're the ones who, who decide where that's going and when it's going. And so it's not about me. It's about us being able to continue our ministry here. And uh, not that we can't. I'm not saying that we're in any trouble. I'm just saying make sure you're emphasizing this in your life because it can slip by and it's still vital. Um, but I want to give you uh, the motivation behind why we give and what we give real quickly. Um, I, here's the reality. I don't want you to be a grouchy giver, okay? I know I'm trying to wrap this up, but I don't want you to be a grouchy giver. Don't be a grouchy giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. This shouldn't be like, oh, I feel guilty, I'm going to give. No, that's not what this is about. I don't want you to give out of the guilt. He says he loves a cheerful giver. So don't give out of that compulsion and don't give grouch in a grouchy way. Oh, I'm just going to get, I'm, you know, we have to give. Here's, if you're going to be a grouchy giver, please keep your money in your own pocket and use it for whatever you want. Because the, the reason you give is because you love the Lord. Okay, I hope you hear me. The, the reason you give is because you have a heart for the Lord and what he is doing. And so if you give in a grouchy way, in an uncheerful way, it's not doing anything for your relationship with God. And that's one of the primary reasons in which you give is to say, God, thank you for this gift that you have given me. I give this portion to the church uh, so that we can do the ministry that we want to do, that, that you, we believe you're wanting us to do. And so I cheerfully give this. I thank you for, for putting food on my plate. I thank you for paying the bills. So it's a cheerful giver. If you're a grouchy giver, you just missed out on that part of worship. So please keep it. Don't, don't bring it. But, but, but have this type of attitude. Have an attitude of, of gratitude, the cheerfulness, and have an attitude of being gracious. Remember the widow, or I think it was the widow who, who could only give this little bitty fraction, like a penny. And these other people could give like, all this money, and God says that it was her who gave more because she, she, she had very little, but she gave a lot from her heart, and she wanted to worship the Lord. And so it's not even about the mount here. I emphasize this because it's about your heart, and it's really about us as a church too, uh, that we would emphasize, yes, Lord, I'm still going to trust you in this time. Now, if, if you lost your job, that's different. Um, and if I'm speaking here to members of our church, um, not talking to you who's just watching this on the go or whatever, like, no, 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 don't, don't send your check here. Unless you just feel the Lord to send it, you know, send it, whatever. Um, but I'm talking to members, and, and if you're a member of another church and you're watching this, uh, man, I, I just want to um, plead with you. That's another word. I'll use that word again. I want to plead with you just... G Keep giving to your local church because this is a, this is a time in which we, we're going to utilize that uh, for, for the glory of God and the ministries in which we have said. And there may be some adjustments, and that's okay if we have to adjust. Um, but I just want to, I don't want to go throughout this time of change in our world and not mention that for us because we need to emphasize that in our world. But I want to say this. 
as, as we come to a close. Um, God sent Jesus to meet the greatest need of our life, right? Sin. To meet the greatest need of our life, separation from him. To meet the greatest need of our life, to resolve the wrath in which God had to give to us. If he did that for us, what will he not take care of in our lives? He will, in fact, take us, take care of us. And so, if you send your check, we don't have online giving yet, maybe soon. But think about this. When you send, and if you send your check to this church, this is what we don't do with it. We don't just leave it on the table and say, huh, cool check, has, has some value on it. And then walk away and never look at the check and never deposit the check. No, we, we take that to the bank and we deposit it. I don't. Someone else does it. But here's what I want to tell you. Now, just like if you sent a check in and we're going to go deposit and be able to use that now. There is a check written for you with your name on it. And the amount on that is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And the author, who is, or, or yeah, the author, the one who signed that check is God himself. God has written a check for your debt of sin, for your wrath in hell. That was the amount on it. The wrath of God was the amount. The person it was written to was your name. And the person who signed it was God himself. And he is here extending checks out to you He's extending this check out, singular, this check out to you. This is the gospel. It's an, this is the good news of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That's what it is. It's God's uh, signature of paying for your penalty that you deserve. You're the one who got into the debt, not him. But he is the one who's providing the payment for your debt. Isn't that good news? And how foolish, how ridiculous, how dead what must we be to just leave the check there and say, well, this is a cool check. I don't, I, don't, I don't really know who that author is. I don't really care for him. Or not the author, but you know the signature person. I don't care for that. I don't know who that is, and I don't care about that amount. I just don't believe in it. Hmm. It's one thing for me not to accept, not me, our church, not to accept the check that you write and to just say, oh, $500 or $100 or $10, you know, just leave it on the table. That's one thing. We'll still be okay as a church. But I can guarantee you this. You will not be okay in eternity if you don't receive and believe the check in which God has given you. That's called a deposit. You have to believe it. You have to trust in it. And when you have that deposit, you'll live like you have forgiveness in your life. And so I, I, I tell you today, trust in the Lord. He is here and he's given you a check. These are the five emphasis for Christians um, to live during this time. I hope you'll emphasize them in your life.